medical degree, but I'm not practicing medicine, although I, I would have done psychiatry if I had continued. But I ended up switching over uh, into philosophy, and I'm a philosophy professor at Loyola, teaching both Eastern and, and Western philosophy. And a number of years ago, I became interested in the, in the whole area of aging. I won't go into the you know, sort of personal, professional story of how that develops. Uh, but I became interested in thinking about particularly Eastern, but also Western models of the life cycle on the second half of life and the later life, and what that has to tell us about aging well here in the West. And as many of you know, it's a very important phenomenon. In fact, I, I opened up my copy of the Globe and Mail a couple of days ago, and there was a big headline story about um, the Canadian census, um, the, the graying of Canada, the, the increasingly aging population which is also a big phenomenon in the United States, where, where I hail from. Um, one figure I find particularly dramatic is that in 1900, a century ago, the average lifespan for Americans, and I'm sure Canadians would be similar, was 46. The average lifespan today in America is a little over 76. Let's see, it was 47, now it's a little over 76. So we have an increase of about 30 years in the average lifespan, which means both that people are, are living longer. The fastest growing demographic is individuals 85 and above. And also that many more people are reaching later life, whereas that used to be the exception, the, the extraordinary individual. Now we've come more and more to expect it as the common course of the life cycle. But even though Western countries have done a very good job at elongating the lifespan through better health care, better sanitation, et cetera, et cetera, I, I think they've done a very poor job in terms of articulating what is the meaning of that longer lifespan. What do we do with all those extra years? Um, what is the value and purpose for us as individuals and also for us as a society? So when you read about it, as in the Globe and Mail or American newspapers, it's usually put almost in terms of a crisis. Like, oh my God, you know, what do we do with, the, with this aging demographic? How are our diminishing um, <clears throat> cohort in youth and midlife going to support the children and the uh, aging parents and grandparents. What a burden this is. And of course there's a lot of uh, ageism in our culture, just as there is sexism and racism, a lot of prejudice toward the, toward the elderly. I notice that even in myself, even though I work in this field, I, I got on a sort of cruise ship yesterday with my daughter to go up the Indian arm. And there was a group of seniors who were on the boat. And I was noticing even in myself a little bit of, you know, sort of mental diminishment of these people or impatience with their slow pace. And, and I'm someone who kind of writes and, and thinks in this area. So it's just now, just as it's very difficult to escape racism, even if you try to be very conscious of it, it's, it's so pervasive in the society. So it is with ageism. And yet, especially with these aging demographics, there's been a lot of literature, especially, I guess, the last 20 years or so, about successful aging and how to age well and how to revalue the later stages of life and, and negotiate them with, with grace and with strength and um, with success. One of the most important books came out a few years ago called Successful Aging 
by Rowan Kahn. And this came out of uh, MacArthur Foundation studies. They drew on about 100 different studies that um, focused on how to age successfully. And they came up with a definition of successful aging as involving three components, a low risk of disease and disability, a high level of mental and physical functioning, and third, a continuing active engagement with life. And a sentence from the introduction uh, that summarizes a little bit their attempt to draw together this research said, in some, we were trying to pinpoint the many factors that conspire to put one octogenarian on cross-country skis and another in a wheelchair. How do we become one and, and not the other? And though in many ways I would rather be, you know, that octogenarian on cross-country skis, would I have the choice I think there's a lot of problems with this model of successful aging. Once we have this notion of aging successfully, we sort of have the flip side. You know, what is it to have, have failed at this process? There's an implication that that person in the wheelchair is a failure of aging. And I think, you know, the, the, the octogenarian on cross-country skis, number one, a lot of people just won't be able to do that physically, and so they end up in the failure heap. But number two, a lot of people may not be able to do that financially. Some of these visions of successful aging work a lot better if you have the wherewithal for various um, physical and um, mental um, and behavioral um, resources. Uh, um, also, the you know the octogenarian on cross-country skis might be an asshole. If you excuse the expression, or they might be doing it just you know the most superficial, self-indulgent, you know, pleasure-oriented mode, while their grandchildren are starving somewhere else. I, I don't know, but if you talk about later life as connected with meaning, connected with purpose, connected with the deepest levels of human fulfillment and human connection. There's no particular reason to suppose the person on cross-country skis is necessarily better off in relation to those indices than the person in the wheelchair. The person in the wheelchair who's had to cope with certain forms of chronic disability may in fact have developed certain modes of compassion, inner strength, spirituality that we're lacking for that person on cross-country skis, or, or vice versa. We, we don't know. But perhaps this uh, suggests that our notion of successful aging needs to be more than just the prolongation of midlife vigor which is really what these studies are focusing on. How can we essentially escape aging? How can we defeat aging by taking our physical and cognitive peaks, you know, when we're in our 30s or our 40s, and just somehow continue to manifest that in our 60s and 70s and 80s? Is that really all that the life cycle is about? Uh, um, simply trying to retard and defeat the problems and diminishments of aging. Well, let me give you an alternative model. And, and this is from an ancient Hindu text called The Laws of Manu, which was written sometime around 100 BC to 100 AD. And, and listen to how much this is not successful aging according to the Western criteria. It says, when a householder sees his skin wrinkled and his hair white and the sons of his sons, so we're in a, a, a sexist model, but essentially they're saying when your hair turns white, when you see your grandchildren, when your skin is wrinkled, then he may resort to the forest 
In other words, he leaves behind all the duties of the householder, raising the family, doing the social dharma with the larger community, pursuing career, making money. Now he resorts to the forest. Let him always be industrious in reciting the Veda, the sacred scriptures. In summer, let him expose himself to the heat of five fires, and during the rainy season, live under an open sky. In winter, be dressed in wet clothes, thus gradually increasing the rigor of his austerities. So this is obviously a spiritual practice. Then, after abandoning all attachment to worldly objects, let him always wander alone without any companion, in order to attain final liberation. So this is the third of four stages described in the laws of Manu that humans should properly go through. The student stage, the householder stage, and then the stage of the forest renunciate. And then finally the stage of the sannyasin, the ascetic, who can wander in and out of society perhaps become a guru or teacher, but has attained final liberation. Well, it seems in a way a particularly gruesome model of successful old age, these kinds of austerities and whatever. But <clears throat> obviously what it's suggesting is that the crucial task of later life is to turn our attention in a way that may not have been possible when we were younger, to the most important goal of human existence, which is spiritual realization. Finding and realizing one's unity with God or, or Brahman or realizing the higher self, whatever, you, whatever language you use to describe that. And earlier in life, we've been very tied up with, with different social roles and ego identifications. We've been raising children, we've been you know, pursuing our career, making money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And finally, in later life, it's time to let go of that, to realize that though that defines certain roles we play within society, that is not all of who we are. Somehow there's a transcendent core, a spark of the divine within, and those social roles also formed a kind of box that, that held us in and, and may have blocked off our access to that most transcendent portion of self. So as aging begins to strip that away, as the children grow up and move away, as we look upon the possibility of retirement or partial retirement, as perhaps we leave behind the home or community we once lived in, as our earning power may diminish, as we begin to become marginalized by society. In a sense, in the West, we're being pushed into that role of the forest renuncia, whether we like it or not. You might even say our society aids in that process by <laughs> kind of um, marginalizing the elders. But in the West, that's seen as a catastrophe. That's seen as precisely the fate we want to avoid and battle against. That would be successful agent. Why is it that in the East, that's seen as a grace and a liberation? That we want to let go of these roles, that we want to contemplate the deeper questions. And so, it seems to me that there's a different model of successful aging at play, which we might call the spiritual model. It's not primarily about you know, having a social safety network. It's not primarily about maintaining physical health. It's not primarily about re remaining productive and active into your later years or enjoying consumerist pleasures. It's really about coming to a kind of fulfillment of soul and using the changes of later life as a curriculum, a sort of advanced curriculum for the growth of soul. 
Ram Das, uh, a spiritual teacher who's also active in this area of conscious aging now, used to say that when you're young, you're, you're sort of learning how to have a self and how to be a self. That's sort of life 101. But life, I don't know how Canadian universities work, but in my college, like the 300 level is the top. So life, you know, 300. It's almost the reverse. Learning how to let go of the self, let go of the ego self. Um, learning how to be a nobody and a nothing, but in a way that expands the self until it includes within it the entirety of the universe and all beings and, and what we call God or what Buddhists call nothingness or whatever you want to the, the Hindu model, the, the Hindu version of the spiritual model of later life is one particular vector, and it emphasizes contemplative interiority, this notion of going off into the forest. And I have some questions, because I don't know for you, but I know for me, these are very personal issues. They're not just about my professional work or my philosophical writings, but they're issues I'm grappling with as an individual, and, and I think we all are. And the first question I have on here for reflection, when you have a contemplative moment, <laughs> if you do at any time during this conference, um, what kind of activities or, or non-activities, Sabbath withdrawal from activities, or locales, open up a contemplative space for you? Now, for some, that may be explicitly religious, involving prayer and meditation. For others, it may have to do with walking in nature, or listening to music, or painting or reading poetry or whatever. But we might say a contemplative activity pulls you into a quiet or joyful presence. You're a human being, not a human doing. Uh, um, you're not involved in the doing activities that serve as a means to an end. And are you making time for them as you age? Because I think one of the messages of this Hindu model is that it's appropriate in the, in the life cycle as we move into the second half of life for most of us to make more time and make more space for this kind of contemplative inward journey. And the culture will say, don't do that. We don't support that. You can't put that on your CV. We won't pay you to do that. Uh, um, so you're really battling against a, a cultural vector. And sometimes people will tell me, you know, after I retired, I got even busier. Because, I, you know, I was sort of uncomfortable with not knowing what I was going to do each day. And everybody found out I was retired and they asked if I could serve on this church committee and do this volunteer work because after all I have all this time on my hands and really couldn't say no and so I'm twice as busy as I was when I was working and it may be kind of crazy to do that you know we may need to use the Hindu model to give ourselves permission to say I've been there I've done that now I want to I want to have that freedom, that time and space to to go inward. Another version of the spiritual model, however, um, which is very prevalent in different cultures, like Native American culture um, and other traditional cultures is that of the elder as activist, the elder as guide for the broader society. Um, after all, in some ways it would be a shame, wouldn't it, if we, if 
we had all this wisdom, we did all this contemplative work, and then we just sort of withdrew from the larger society and didn't give anything back to it. <clears throat> Hang on a minute, I'm, I'm losing my quality of presence. So let me take a moment here. The elder in a lot of cultures is associated particularly with wisdom and experience. Uh, um, they are the guardian of you know, the traditions going back many generations. You also may have heard the, the notion that um, the elder can see unto the seventh generation the impact of decisions upon the future of the tribe. So the elder can not only see a long way backwards, but also because of their life experience and their enhanced perspective, can see a long way into the future. Also because one's children have grown up and moved away and one's not as involved in petty politics and, and you know, kind of personal agendas The elder within a Native American context and, and other traditional cultures becomes sort of a father or mother for the whole community. They have the interests of the whole in mind in a way they didn't when they were younger. And even for the earth, there's a very traditional role of the elder as guardian of the earth. And considering the relationship between the tribe and the non-human and more than human entities that surround it, the hills and the rivers and the animals. In our culture, once again, in our societies, we have this massive influx of elders. And you will read these stories that say, oh my God, what a drain on social resources. But if you flip it around, this model, once again, you know, turns it on its head and says, you know, the elders are actually one of the greatest resources themselves that a society has to draw on for all the reasons that I just mentioned. The elders are a crucial element in mentoring the young, in guarding the rituals of the tribe, in taking the broader vision of political issues and, and being involved in decision making. And so it may be that this massive influx of elders that we're seeing in, in the United States, in Canada, in other societies, maybe it will save us. Because what do we need in our culture of materialism and technology run rampant and, and various forms of oppression and you know, drug addiction and whatever? We need elder wisdom. You know, to help us find our feet. There's an author, Theodore Rozak, who, who many, many years ago wrote a book called The Making of the Counterculture. He was one of the first people to discover the, the kids of the 60s, late 60s and early 70s, and proclaim that this was a whole countercultural movement that was going to radically change uh, um, the West. His newest book is called America the Wise. I think it's actually been retitled. It didn't sell as much as he wanted, so they gave it a catchy, catchy new title. And there he says, no, I sort of, in a way, I got it wrong. But the baby boomers of that generation, who now are turning into today's elders, they have actually, you know, they did sort of you know, re-enter the society, but now they've really grown out of their culture's values. So at a certain point, if you get old enough, you really outgrow the values of the culture. That's why advertisers don't target their media barrage toward elders. It's not that there isn't a lot of buying power among elders, but it says elders don't pay attention to advertising. You know, they're sort of past being turned on by the sexy blonde with a beer or something. So 
so they don't bother to advertise to them. But these elders, Theodore Rozak said, have a lot of power and a lot of money and a lot of numbers uh, that they didn't when they were in their teenage years. And this is really going to help revolutionize society. I don't know if he's right or not, but it's sort of an interesting hypothesis that the cutting edge in the 21st century is going to be coming from elders, not from the youth, who often are furiously trying to become assimilated and successful in the eyes of the larger culture, often are very conservative, you may notice. So once again, to personalize it, um, I asked this question of myself and, and you. What gift or gifts would you most like to pass on to others, to the community, to the planet, before you depart? What kinds of mentoring relations or public involvements might allow you to pass on these gifts? I think we have to begin to look our, on ourselves as elders, not elderly, but wise elders, or wise elders in training, who have to go against the cultural vector and really seek out connections across the generations and roles within our community and our professional organizations and our churches and synagogues and mosques and our political leadership. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi Zalman Schachter envisions an international network of elders, um, kind of linked by internet, who act as advisors to political bodies and nations around the world. What can we do about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Um, I have an article, actually, I won't read it in the interest of time, but it's about three years old from the New York Times which was about peace negotiations held in Maryland between Netanyahu and Arafat, Palestinians and the Israelis, which came to a surprisingly successful conclusion at the time. A peace agreement was signed, which has since been abandoned. In the end, it says King Hussein played the critical role in coaxing peace. King Hussein was in America having his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma treated. He died shortly thereafterwards, but he rushed to the scene of the peace negotiations. The, the King of Jordan, who fought a war against Israel, who opposed the United States in the Persian Gulf, and who kicked the PLO out of Jordan. So he'd been in enemy of all the participants in the peace process when he was a younger man. And he came there and he said, if I had an ounce of strength, I would have done my utmost to be there and to help in any way I can. We quarrel, we agree, we are friendly, we're not friendly, but we have no right to dictate through irresponsible action or narrow-mindedness the future of our children and our children's children. And President Clinton said that it was King Jordan's courage, commitment, wisdom, and frankly, stern instruction at appropriate times that were at the heart of the success. So we have a little vision of you know what things look like with elder wisdom present. Now, three or four years later, I don't know any comparable figure who is stepping into the breach with that kind of elder wisdom. But we need it. A couple of other sort of quick takes on this spirituality of later life and the special kind of tasks and opportunities as we grow into our elderhood. Um, let me switch over to the Christian and the Buddhist traditions, um, which emphasize a lot our encounter with suffering and the potentially liberatory aspects of that encounter. You may remember that in the story of Buddha, 
Siddhartha Gautama is a prince who lives in a glorious kingdom that has been artificially sheltered by his father to keep Siddhartha Gautama's mind on the world. So it's peopled with 40,000 dancing girls and every kind of you know, culinary pleasure or whatever. But they, one day, Siddhartha Gautama is riding in the streets and he sees first an old person, crooked and bent over, then a sick person, and then a corpse. And he realizes, this is going to happen to me. All the pleasure I'm taking in the world is transitory and will be lost. And at last he sees a Hindu monk in, in ochre robes, and he realizes the possibility of spiritual transcendence, leaves his kingdom, undergoes many different meditative and ascetic practices, and finally awakens into the Buddha, the awakened one. In, in Christianity, we have sort of a different story about suffering, but Jesus, even though he died as a young man around age 33, you could say that in the Passion of Christ, just as Buddha kind of saw all that was coming, Jesus goes through in sort of speeded up, you know, time-lapse photography form, a lot of the losses that we go through much more slowly as we age. But, you know, physical pain with the crown of thorns, abandonment and humiliation as he's stripped naked, and a lot of people, as they go grow into their elderhood, do feel abandoned and humiliated by the larger society, trivialized or degraded by the physical problems they're wrestling with and the treatment in hospitals, nursing homes, etc. Jesus obviously has to face death square on as we do as we get older even kind of spiritual crisis, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These are a lot of the struggles and sufferings that we may go through as we age. And yet, both in the Buddhist and the Christian story, these are understood as, as very deeply involved with love and liberation. That somehow it's as we undergo that suffering that our heart is broken and broken open with a new kind of compassion, new ability to experience and feel with the suffering of others. And also, with this heightened vulnerability, we're not only perhaps more able to give in a rich and loving way, but we also become more able, more open to receiving in a rich, and loving way. Um, you know, Jesus at one point said, I'm going to, you know, wash your feet. And the disciples said, no, no, we won't let you do that. And he said, shut up and give me your feet. Um, you can't have a giver without a receiver. And Buddha, of course, spent the last about 50 years of his life traveling the dusty roads of India, giving away what he had received, rather than going off into his private nirvana. And he needed those who would, who would receive from him. And a lot of times, one of the great fears as we age is that we will become receivers. That, that in a way, you know, our culture so values autonomy and, and maybe helping others, supporting others, but it doesn't teach us the lessons of vulnerability and neediness and interdependence and, and receiving, because that means really letting go of the ego. That means really being dependent and reliant upon the love of the community and the love of God. And one grace that can come with aging is that kind of enhanced willingness, necessity, and ability to receive in a gracious way, 
And so many people are so afraid of being a burden upon their children. But that can be a tremendous grace when the child for whom you've cared turns around and has the opportunity to care for you. It can be a grace when we draw together in community. We have to live with others. We rely on one another. And it can be a grace when we fall to our knees in prayer and, and rely in a deeper way on God or whatever you call the, the Spirit. You know, even when Jesus was saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's talking to God. He's calling forth God. Um, and I know for myself, my deepest prayers have often come out of pain. You know, help. Um, you know, and one of the neat things, going back to that octogenarian in the wheelchair, is that people, even people who are rather disabled by their illness, somebody who's really hospitalized or in a nursing home or whatever, who is not a successful ager, according to our usual criteria, they may have within them the spirit of prayer. They may be praying for the world. They may be even using their own suffering as a kind of prayer. Um, I remember a story, a um, gerontologist friend of mine was called to the bedside of a woman who was suffering from cancer and was a real pain in the butt to all the staff. She would do nothing but complain and bitch and feel sorry for herself. And, you know, obviously she had cancer, but also everybody's nerves were getting frayed. And, and they didn't know what to do to help her. This person went in and said, you know, a lot of pain? And she said, yeah, I'm continually in pain. She said, well, why don't we try something unusual? Why don't you today, you know, there's a, there's a couple in the hospital room next to you, a man and a wife, both of whom are suffering. I think, you know, the man had whatever, Alzheimer's, and the woman had diabetes and whatever. When you feel your pain from your cancer today, why don't you kind of offer that up as your prayer? Sort of, you know, take the suffering as a gift and ask that their suffering be alleviated, that you suffer in their place, kind of like Jesus did. Just try that. Women say, well, I don't know. Okay, I'll give it a try. And my friend went into the hospital room the next day to the, the woman with cancer and said, how are you doing? And she said, forget about me. How are the couple next door doing? You know, she'd really sort of forgotten about her pain. Her pain actually had diminished dramatically. And she'd become a bit more pleasant for the staff to deal with. Because rather than being constricted by the pain, she was using it as a mode of expansion and liberation. Once again, it's not a trick our culture teaches us very much about, but these ancient wisdom traditions like Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity have a lot to say about how to work creatively with suffering. Let me just close my remarks very quickly by, by reversing the focus and saying, you know, there's also a lot in the aging process that has to do with joy and playfulness. Now, one of the perhaps negative stereotypes in our culture is the, is the, the childish old person who has become a bit dotty and, and irrelevant. Uh, um, you know, kind of gone around the bend, shouldn't be taken too seriously. And let me read you a poem that sort of takes that stereotype and flips it on its head. Many of you may be aware of that poem by Jenny Joseph called Warning. But it begins, when I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals and say we've no money for butter 
I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick the flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. <laughs> you can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go or only bread and pickle for a week and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But now, she's about 40 when she wrote this poem, but now we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the streets and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now so people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I'm old and start to wear purple. Uh, um, there's a great tradition that as you get older, you can increasingly put aside all the conventions of the broader society, you know, being feminine if you're a woman or being virile if you're a man, you know, according yourself to the ideals of sexual attractiveness. Uh, um, and in a way, you can finally become yourself in a more authentic way. In a funny way, I don't think that's opposite to the Hindu model where you're abandoning yourself. Because I don't know quite how to say it, but you know, the people who are most abandoned of self, the great kind of gurus and teachers, Gandhi, whatever, also you feel that they're most authentically who they are. You know, there's a wonderful Hasidic story where Rabbi Zuzia, on the eve of his death, is asked, what do you think you'll say to God, and what will God ask you when you die? And Zuzia said, God will not ask me, why were you not Abraham? God will not say, why were you not Moses? God will ask, why were you not Zuzia? And that's a question for all of us. Um, how to grow into becoming our truest, most fulfilled self. And that can happen in later life. In the story of Sarah and Abraham, God takes them out of the land they've lived in. God gives them a new name. God gives them a child in later life and takes them through a whole kind of rebirth process that becomes the beginning of the Jewish people, their child Isaac, which means to laugh in Hebrew, uh, um, comes out of the kind of first cynical and then joyful laughter at what happens to Sarah and Abraham in later life. And I think a lot of us know an elder who models that. Somehow in later life they rebirth the self. They take some joyful or creative or new direction and develop and express certain powers that were underdeveloped when they were younger. And later life can be a wonderful time for these kinds of flights. So what I want to close with is just to say that there is a broader movement afoot. I think we're just at the beginning of it called the conscious aging movement. Probably will grow as more and more baby boomers crest over 50 and 60 and beyond. But it's already started. I, I work a bit with an institute called the Spiritual Eldering Institute based in Boulder, Colorado, that supports this kind of work. I think I listed on the bottom of the handout about eight or 10 books that have already come out in this field. One of them I particularly recommend from personal experience, the one I wrote, um, Spiritual Passages, which they have at the bookstore here, which goes through about 12 different versions of the spiritual model of aging. We've talked about maybe four of them here today with different sort of exercises and meditation questions. There have been conferences on this topic. 
Uh, I'm working with a group of ex-nuns who are building a residential community for people who want to come there and live and, and work on the spirituality of later life in community. So I think we're part of a very exciting movement, um, both as individuals and as a culture, um, as, we, as we walk into our later years. I think we do have a few minutes. I wish there were more time for comments and discussion and questions. So let's kind of open it up. Yes. How would you see this paradigm working for the person with middle to late stage Alzheimer's disease? This in many of the clients that I do work with, I should qualify, have very much lost their ego. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in that field in the way you are, so it'd be a bit presumptuous. But I, my, my own sense of it is that the last thing you said is very telling that sometimes people with Alzheimer's, as you say, they are letting go of the self. Changes. And sometimes the model of care and treatment is about trying to, at all costs, keep them oriented, keep them in their previous identity, um, often making the relatives feel more comfortable because the person seems more familiar. But sometimes that causes a great deal of pain for the person as they're being taught, we must pull you back to this previous identity that the disease is sweeping away from you. And so there may be a way of working with it rather than working against the changes and celebrating in some way this move into a new kind of incarnation. And I know it's not all sweetness and light a lot of times, but just allowing the person to work with whatever is, 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 is grace-filled and liberating in that mode and teaching the relatives to work with it as well. Yes? A construct or a, or a metaphor or symbol for all our age Well, there's a wonderful book by Michael Murphy called Golf in the Kingdom, the founder of Esalen. And Ram Das became an avid golfer in his 60s. Um, so I think it depends. There's a wonderful book I saw the other day called Gita on the Golf Links. Something which, <laughs> it takes this movie, um, what's this movie about a golfer? Um, Bagger Vance. And Bagger Vance was explicitly written as a Western version of the Bhagavad Gita, apparently, where the story of Arjuna and Krishna is transposed into the golf course. So in the worst, in the worst sense, I think golf stands in for that really trivial notion of aging successfully, just passing your time without any kind of deep meaning or fulfillment. Literally, it's a pastime. But once again, maybe we can understand, you know, re-envision golf as the great yoga for, <laughs> for elders. Um, it all depends how you, how you play with it and, and play it. Yes? Yeah, I think that's one of the things we need to uh, escape from with any kind of stereotype of what is the correct way to do I think what is incredibly remarkable about our, uh, our living longer in some ways is the choices that are open for options. This may be, you know, mm -hmm. the spiritual quest may be just one option mm -hmm. for some. Certainly not going to be for everybody. Yeah. It never has been or will be. Uh, so that, you know, playing golf in the lakes serves an economic purpose mm -hmm. or whatever. <laughs> brings more joy to the world. One of the things I like about the spiritual model is that it, it doesn't really exclude anybody, whether you're on, you know, cross-country skis, communing with nature, or you're the person in the wheelchair or working with your suffering. And I tried to mention, you know, this may lead you, you may feel your heart going in a contemplative 
direction of withdrawal or in an activist direction or you may have to work with suffering or you may be into playfulness and humor and this may change at different stages so I think we do want a model that really is available to all kinds of different personalities and lifestyles and inspirations yes I like what you just said about change and that motivated me to stand up and just, just witness. I'm living over in Del Webb, Sun City, Texas. And not only are people trying to keep their economic portfolios diversified, <laughs> but their activity portfolios. The most common phrase used there is, my plate is full. Um, I think we call it refirement rather than retirement. But it's not hectic work um, for some people. For, you know, there's always some for everything. But the general sense is that it's a quality of non-frenetic, non-concerned, vocational guidance kind of people change this activity. They'll hang out with square dancing for a while and they get more involved with their church. Uh, they'll shift from working with the church and then shift over to community politics in the broader community that uh, Del Webb is associated with the town. They'll get involved in local community governance issues and then shift more into the art, one of the art studios and self-expression. Most people have several different areas of involvement and I'm finding it a fun challenge, and I'm intrigued with what you said about the community you're building, um, of how to build and develop community there. And I can tell you with great authority that I'm not sure yet. <laughs> but we're talking, we started a senior learning program, grassroots, and it's fun to watch folks over 55, 60, most of them, I say the medium age is about 70, 72. Um, really engaging. And there's a, I say a bell shaped curve, but fitting with what you're saying, so it's exciting. But there is that changing constantly, and people will settle into something, and there's also a diversification. So people aren't into one model or another, they're oftentimes into a mixture. Thank you. Thank you. We just have maybe a minute left. Um, any other comments, questions? Yeah. Well, something that I think comes up when you start talking about when, uh, when the elderly have opportunity to start contemplating spirituality and meaning. Um, the model of the private label is just going to My book, Spiritual Passages, a sort of dominant model is the kind of yin-yang model of Taoism. That really, the, maybe the fullest spirituality is sort of a harmonizing of opposites, and there are times of yin and times of yang, you know, more receptive and more assertive energy. And I, I think, you know, you kind of said that nicely. Yes. In the beginning of your presentation, you referred to a book called Successful Aging. It's by um, two authors, Rowe, R O W E, and Khan, K A H N. Um, and I'm actually forgetting their first name. 
Uh, um, but it's easy, easy to find. And I mentioned those names, I think, on this little handout sheet at the top here. Yes? I'm not getting into the whole discussion. I'm sensing tensions between otherworldly kinds of thinking and this world kind of thinking. We're seeing the pattern of differences in these two Western countries in some general ways. And, and also, then starts patterning the elderly and younger kinds of life. And, and just as the, uh, the thought, maybe the stuff we're talking about is elderly, we ought to be doing all our lives, and then the elderly is really the rest of the world. The elderly is just supporting the whole issue of our culture and its corruption. Well, I think that's true, and that's a wonderful way to end the session. Uh, um, like Zaman Shakhtar, this person I mentioned, I highly recommend his book, From Aging to Staging, said, you know, if you wait to do this kind of eldering work until you're really far along in your elderhood, you really may be because the feeling from your body, you know, the struggles you're going through are not necessarily the time begin to process and work with these different, different you know, structures and practices. So he said, get, get started with your eldering work as young as possible. <laughs> you, know, you can, you know, do it in your teens better if maybe it's your 40s that you have the moment of Buddha where you see the person and the sixth person and the core life crisis or maybe or 60s. In a certain sense, we, don't, we wouldn't even call it eldering, I guess. It would be just part of the but um, the better. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, and there are all different age groups represented in this room. So, but we're all aging. Anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate your. Oh, thank you. So, you actually. Do I'm some work in this yeah, area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In fact, Zal was a buddy of mine. Oh, okay. My wife and I. And oh, really? Read his book, but I have developed my own. So. In fact, I'm giving a talk. Oh, wait. Yeah, talk. Unfortunately, we have things to do. Well, you gave my talk anyway. Oh. So I, th I appreciate it. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the